Well, I'm gonna speak to you about skill-based hiring and increasing diversity in tech talent. I'm with a company called General Assembly. What we do is that we empower individuals to pursue the work that they love. We do that by skilling them in high demand tech technologies and software skills such as web development, user experience, data science, and also business. I'm lucky enough to be the regional director here. I work with a fantastic team of instructors and individuals in our River North campus. Previously, I worked at companies such as GMR Marketing and Reebok. I got my bachelor's at the University of Denver, my master's at the University of Texas. Well, what I just gave you is what's commonly found on resumes, your education and your experience. But does that mean I can do the job? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Are we looking at the right things in terms of when we're hiring people? More importantly, I did not play in Hamilton. <laughs> Actually, my family came over to, to the United States as refugees. When they were 16 and 17 years old, my mom and dad came over during the Vietnam War. They didn't have money, they didn't have an education, they couldn't speak the language. But they hustled, worked two jobs, and were able to provide. But finding jobs was really difficult. My father ended up taking a, uh, learning about some skills in machinery where they would take some, say, aluminum and turn them into widgets. But he had a really, really difficult time finding a job. We're gonna go back to the story in a little bit. The reason why Hamilton is up here is because there's a line in Hamilton. Actually, who, who has seen the Hamilton? Fantastic, if you haven't seen it, please do. It is so, so, such an inspiring message. But there's a line in there that says, immigrants, we get the job done. My parents are some of those immigrants. So let's go ahead and get started about what we're seeing in the tech workplace so far. Challenges. It's no surprise to anyone in this room that ethnic minorities, LGBTQ, and women are tech are underrepresented. I'm actually gonna show you some startling facts for those that are trying to increase diversity and inclusion, and they're just not getting the job done yet. We're also gonna talk about access to education. We know those with socioeconomic um, hardships are having a difficult time getting to education. So why are we putting so much value in colleges and in university degrees? Which are valuable, but should it be the only thing that we look at? We also have a tech talent gap as well. By 2024, there's gonna be one million new jobs in tech talent. And where are we gonna find talent to fill these roles? We're also gonna address conscious and subconscious bias in hiring as well. Conscious bias could be I'm only gonna look at men, or I'm gonna only look at women for this role. Something subconscious is when the hiring manager or the recruiter says, I want someone to look or be something that I am already. Someone that maybe went to university or partook in certain clubs or certain activities while at university. So that's something that uh, we're seeing in subconscious uh, bias as well. These are some of the biggest tech titans in Silicon Valley and in Seattle. And look at these numbers. For instance, Facebook, 33% of, uh, of their employment, our employees are, third, are women, 2% are black, and only 4% are Hispanic. Startling numbers. And these companies have made it a point to increase diversity and inclusion, but they're just not getting the job done yet. So how do we get there? How do we bridge the talent gap? Well. Let's go back to my father. My father, once again, went to trade school, learned how to be a machinist, had a difficult time interviewing because he didn't speak the language. So while getting frustrated during the, during the interview process, he said, finally to an interviewer that was about to cut him off, that let me show you what I know. Let me show you what I know. So Thomas Vu took his uh, interviewer to the machine shop and showed the interview what he could do with the machine. And guess what? He got the job. Today, Thomas Vu has his own business, and he employs 350 minorities. Without a college education, without a high school degree, nothing but a GRE, and uh, going to trade school. So let me show you what I know, is what he told him. 
So first thing we need to do is rein in the college bias. Secondly, level the playing field with skill-based hiring. What applications can we use, what programs can we use to help us? We're in the technology age, let's use software to help us. What are some of the major roadblocks and some of the next steps? First of all, rating in the college bias. This top stat is startling. If, when you're going through the hiring funnel, you enter your resume into maybe a black hole, into a, a database, you hope to get a response, right? Well, if the first screen is college, well, that's gonna eliminate a huge amount of your talent population. 9% of college graduates between the ages of 25 and 29 are black. The same percentage is for Hispanics as well. So if you're listing college or university as one of your screens and when you're in the hiring process, you've eliminated so many people. Probably even qualified people that can do the job. Next, if you're thinking about, well, we have a one million um, jobs that will be created by 2024 in tech. Well, maybe our computer science uh, graduates or those that are in computer science will help bridge the gap. Well, if you look that far, only 4% of those individuals are black, 8% are Hispanic, 84% are men. So we can't look towards computer science graduates or those currently in those programs as the answer. When we look broader into STEM programs, current individuals that are in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, three to one or four to one ratios for men to women. So this is not just only in computer science, this is a much broader issue. Finally, when we look at certain companies, they only want to hire from the top universities, Ivy League schools, the Stanfords of the world, which is fine, but you're looking at 0.4% of college graduates come from Harvard, Brown, Stanford. So where are these people coming from? You have to find talent in other places, so you have to expand the talent pool because there are only so many black women with computer science majors that went to Harvard on a yearly basis. Here's an example of someone doing it right. Ernst & Young in the United Kingdom Oh, if you're not familiar with Ernst & Young, they're a consulting and accounting firm. But in the United Kingdom, they did this study, an 18-month audit of college graduates, and if, uh, excuse me, of, uh, of their employees. 18-month study. And what they found was there was no correlation between successful employees that had a college degree or without a college degree. They found that there was no difference of the background, that successful people were just successful uh, for other reasons. So what they did was they dropped the college degree requirement. You got your photo? <laughs> yeah, not a problem. So how do we level the playing field? Well, using data and assessments, let's test people what they can do, not necessarily what they, where they went to school or where they worked in the past. And also combining that with blind hiring applications, which I'll get into in a little bit. This has been around, by the way, since World War I. The US military tests all of their incoming recruits on what their skill sets are, and then places them into the right division. You can also test for soft skills, such as personality, such as drive, determination. You can also test for hard skills. How good is your code? You know, what's your portfolio look like? An example of this is actually with MetLife the insurance giant. They test their insurance representatives, their salespeople, on optimism. How optimistic are you naturally? The reason why? Because they found out, comparing optimistic versus unoptimistic individuals, there was a 27% sales difference between the two, if you're just more optimistic as a person. Makes sense. It actually gets even more profound in year two. The more optimistic salespeople outsold their counterparts by 57%. This is real world results. When we combine that with blind hiring, we can have results. For instance, the top 25 American symphonies and orchestras started to use blind hiring, which meant that 
a panelist would stay, what, four panelists would be behind a curtain. And the individual, the performer, would be on the other side performing. And they would be judged on merit, not their physical attributes. Why was this important? Because 5% of American symphonies and orchestras were comprised of women, only 5%. By moving to a blind audition process, women were able to be called back by 50% increase, and also we increased, we, I'm not, I'm not symphonists, but <laughs> um, they were able to increase uh, the women in the population, in the, in the orchestra, by 25% by just going to this model, not looking at the person for who they are, but what they can do. How many of you ever heard of The Voice? It's a popular reality television show that has a singer on a stage, and they were being judged by panelists that sit away from them with their backs turned, and if the panelist likes who the singer is, they hit a button, and the chair swivels around, and they are introduced to the singer. So this is used in real world examples today on reality TV, so why can't we incorporate it into our tech workplace? So what are some of the applications we can do to bridge that gap? Well, at General Assembly, we have a program called the Credentials Network, where we work with partners such as Google and Dropbox and L'Oreal to see what skills are their employees really strong at? What are some of the weaknesses in their programming or in their data science or in their digital marketing? And then we can either build a assessment that goes back and tests against these for incoming recruits, or we can reskill their employees. Blendor, which is the logo here on the right hand side, um, I call this the Tinder of hiring, where when you start to use Blendor, you go to their website, you take an assessment, and you're judging your, your strengths of code development. Well, employer partners, when they're looking for you, they will see not your name, not your profile, they just see how well you tested on this assessment. And they can swipe right or swipe left with you. You can also see Facebook, say, for instance, needs a Python programmer, and you can swipe right or swipe left on them if you don't necessarily want to work with them. So it's the matchmaking of uh, Tinder and hiring combined with Blendor on the right-hand side. On the left, we have what's called gap jumpers. What they do is you do an online profile with them, and then they match you with certain companies where your skill sets are best needed. Triple Byte on the bottom right-hand side is actually a really interesting company because they're shortening that funnel where instead of the skill sets being tested you know, further down during the interview process, they want that to be toward the top. So with Triple Byte, you can take an online assessment and say you're really strong in, in SQL or you're really strong in Python, but Facebook isn't really looking for SQL or, or Python. They're looking for something else. Well, they'll let you know that so you don't blindlessly aim, uh, apply to Facebook and wonder why you're not getting a callback. Well, they'll tell you why they're not getting a callback, but they may say, you know what, Google, though, is interested in you and they'll help match you. So a triple bite um, is on the cutting edge of something like that as well. But what are some of the major roadblocks that we're facing here in the tech community? One is time. Time, hiring managers and recruiters are tasked with a lot, especially when you're talking about a startup or a growth stage company that need to hire 100 people in a year, 50 people in a couple months. They're expanding at such a rapid pace that what they're given is job descriptions and very little information about what they need to be hiring for. So they just go to the age-old background of, we're gonna apply, we're gonna phone interview, we're gonna bring people on, onto the uh, campus or the office, and then we're going to um, interview and make an offer to one or two people. And they have, the process repeats over and over again. Instead, what we are looking to do is truncate that where well, let's start off with the skills. Let's see who can do what we need them to do. And then we bring them in for a final interview, which is what Triple Byte does. And once you bring them for a final interview, you start to make that offer. So you put the onus on the applicant to prove what they know. Instead of going through all these screening process and phone interviews to learn more about the person and their education background and, and what they've done. 
We also see this mentality of um, a checkbox strategy of diversity and inclusion. We can't have diversity and inclusion be just something that we do as a company or as a tech community. It has to be within the DNA of, a, of each one of us. And we have to be able to openly talk about that. Instead of saying, okay, you know, let's applaud ourselves for hiring a black female engineer, you know, why, why stop there? You know, that's, it, we can't just check that box. We have to continue the conversation further and further. And this is actually one of the real interesting roadblocks here, profit over diversity. I recently had a conversation with a startup CEO here, a company, about 300 folks. And I asked him, where, where does diversity and inclusion play into your company and your culture? He said, it doesn't. We've talked about it, but it doesn't. Because I am so concerned about feeding my 300 employees. I'm so concerned about keeping the lights on. I'm so concerned about growing my company that I don't have the bandwidth to address diversity and inclusion. That's a major roadblock that we need to get around. Applications such as what General Assembly and those other companies such as TripleByte are doing will only will actually free up the hiring manager's time. They will free up the time for HR to, to focus on developing the employees. They'll also focus on the projects that need to be associated with those uh, new employees instead of going all through these long processes to hire someone. Let's make that hiring process faster. Instead of taking 42 days, let's make it half that. So what are the next steps? Today's a great start. Today is a wonderful start for that. We need to continue with the dialogue, educate our employers, educate our team members about some of these programs. What can we do for diversity and inclusion? We need to educate about the solutions as well. In 2014, $214 million was invested in HR software. That number is growing rapidly. That's double of what it was in 2009, 2009. As more and more money comes in, what we can do to increase diversity would certainly help in terms of truncating that hiring time. And finally, we need to increase educational access too. Because as we saw, four-year universities isn't going to be an answer. It might be coding boot camps. I see friends from Dev Boot Camp here. It could be looking at associate's degree. It could be a variety of ways, but we can't just say no because you didn't go to college anymore. You know, We can't say no to those individuals anymore. So we have to increase educational access. We have to increase interest in the STEM fields. And that way, we can increase the talent pool so those numbers that are at three or four percent can rapidly increase closer to what you know, the streets of Chicago, the streets of Silicon Valley look like. If we do that correctly, the programmers, the, the data scientists, uh, the tech individuals will look more like this than what we're currently seeing today. I hope you don't forget to connect with us. Uh, once again, my name is Johnny Vu. I will be more than happy to answer any questions at this moment. Thank you. Sure. Let um, me see if I uh, got the question correctly. So moving up the skill bias you're on board with, but you're, you're also seeing that when you get later on to the hiring process, that hiring managers, their biases show up again. And it might be even more magnified at that point. Yeah. So, um, that's interesting you bring this up because Google actually has a great program to combat this where um, they ask you questions, um, so you hire based on the skill sets that you need. And you, when you do that, Google has a program where you enter what you need and a series of questions come out. And those are the questions that the hiring manager and that the recruiter has to ask. And they're graded on that. So it's consistent and removes all biases. So I think if we can get to a point where there's more con uh, consistency, <laughs> um, there can be more consistency with that, then I think we're in a much better place. And we remove those biases that the hiring manager will have. Thank you, good, good question. No, absolutely, so the, the question was, skill base um, helps the employer um, more so than it really helps the applicant. Am I, am I gathering that correctly? Especially when you're looking at 
some of those uh, larger initiatives, like do are the, the applicants educated on what an employer is doing to make others feel welcomed? Am I get, getting this correctly? Oh, it's on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, but what I'm getting at is that it takes education. It takes where the employer it has to start with the employer is broadcasting what type of culture they have. And it, when we get to uh, the interview process, bringing the individual into the workplace where they can connect with others from the, uh, the company, uh, so they feel more welcomed. Um, and it, you know, is it a one-stop shop solution? No, certainly not. It does need to go beyond that. But in terms of what the employer does, I think they just need to educate their employees, and they need to educate via their social medias, their sponsorships, uh, what groups that they're involved in to broadcast that message of, of inclusion. Sure. So the question was, how do we incorporate um, a hiring method where we're looking at the soft skills, um, being able to incorporate or integrate within a company versus maybe a hard skill of how good your programming is, for instance? Um, that's an interesting question. I think it goes back to looking at uh, assessing, using data um, with soft skills, right? T testing someone's ability and what, what they find valuable in terms of kindness rating or ability to work within teams. I think if you're able to evaluate that and use that data, uh, if it's important within your company, which it sounds like it is, then I think you're, you're definitely going in the right direction. Um, there's nothing preventing us from using soft skills to assessments and hard skill assessments on top of blind hiring as well. I think you could do all three. Uh, we're, out sorry. we're out of time? Okay. Uh, I'm going to be around afterwards uh, if you certainly want to chat. Um, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it so much.